Hello everyone, Leo Fontana here and today I'm going to be talking to you about the six big lies of the church building. And these are six things that I personally have been taught in church buildings that when you compare them to what the Bible actually teaches, uh, they're complete lies from Satan. Now, there are many more than six, okay, let me say that to start out with, um, but these are the, the main six that I've noticed that are taught in most professing Christian church buildings, um, and I've heard many of the brethren around the world that I, that I correspond with uh, have heard these as well, have been taught these in, in church buildings by pastors. And when you look at what the Bible teaches, you can tell very quickly that they're lies. They're just man-made tradition and nonsense. Um, so I want to go over these six in this video. I have a lot of scripture to go over, um, but obviously I can't go over every single verse to cover um, these, these six lies I'm going to talk about here. So what I encourage you to do is to look at these on your own. Um, my prayer in making this video is that maybe you're in a church building system right now and you're, you're saved, maybe you're starting to feel the, the Holy Spirit there leading lead you out because He will do that if you are saved in a church building. Um, at some point, uh, the Holy Spirit will lead you out of that system. And, and again, my, my prayer is that you will, what, you will listen to what I have to say in this video. Um, you will think about these things. Maybe these are things you've been taught in your church building. You'll study them further on your own and see that they're just lies. They have nothing to do with the Bible. As I've said before, church buildings have nothing to do with the Bible. They're not in the Bible. They're not commanded by God. Um, they're man-made tradition based on Roman Catholicism and, and pagan, paganism before that. So, um, again, these are, these are what I call the six... Uh, big lies of the church building, but there are many, many more. Okay, I just want to make that clear before I get started. So I'm going to go over these, look, look at what the scripture says, um, and, and, and talk about these six lies, because I, I really feel like these six lies I'm going to talk about today are, are, are very key, um, because they can lead you down a, a very dangerous path. They can lead you away from the truth of, of the Bible and of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're saved, um, they can completely take you take you away from fellowship with the Lord, take away your millennial inheritance. Um, if you're lost, these lies will keep you lost. You will probably not get saved if you believe these lies. So um, that's why I, I think these are the six most important. And these are the six that I felt the Holy Spirit leading me to discuss today in this video. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and just read the six first to start out with, and then we'll just jump into number one and start talking about it. So... The six lies, uh, or the six uh, big lies of the church building are, number one, everyone is welcome in God's house. That's something I've heard in many church buildings. And when you look at the Bible, um, that's completely uh, the opposite of what the Bible teaches. All right, number two, um, you get lost people saved by bringing them to your church building. I'm sure you've heard that before. Um, I've talked about in other videos, church buildings I've attended, they have these, uh, what I call membership drives, where they have these... Uh, these things called a bring your, your friend to church day and, and, and all this other nonsense. Um, that's not how you get people saved. And in fact, it's really how you condemn people to hell. Um, and, and that's what these buildings do. Uh, they create false converts and, and condemn people to hell for the most part. Uh, number three, everyone who says they're a Christian is saved. I'm sure you've heard that before. I've heard pastors say that. You can't question someone's salvation. You can't judge them. You'll hear that word used a lot. Uh, the Bible actually t doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches you're supposed to try the spirits. You're supposed to see if these people are of God. Um, and if they're not, obviously, you're supposed to separate from them. And I've talked about this in other videos. You're not supposed to have lost people and saved people coming together to worship the Lord. Because lost people are children of the devil. Saved people are children of God. So how can you have children of the devil and children of God come together and worship Jesus when lost people don't even believe uh, in Jesus and that he's, that he's God? So uh, that, that's going to be number three. Uh, or number, yeah, number three. Number four. Um, as a Christian, you're required to pay God by tithing at least 10% of your income to your church building. I've heard that. I, I've heard that taught many times, this whole concept of paying God. And I put it in quotes um, because it's, it's, it's so ridiculous when you look at what the Bible actually teaches. There are no church buildings, so obviously you don't have to pay God anything uh, to attend a church building. Um, but I'm going to look at uh, what the Bible says about that concept, where these ministers of Satan get that term from, and what the Bible actually teaches about giving uh, for a Christian. So that would be number four. Number five is God loves the sinner and hates the sin. 
I'm sure you've heard that before. There, there's, a, there's a few different ways to put it. Um, I just put it in that, that, that sense uh, for the purposes of this video, that God loves the sinner and hates the sin, right? You've probably heard that. that that's a big church building lie that you will not find in the Bible. Um, we're going to look at what the Bible says about that. Number six, it doesn't matter which Bible version you use because they're all the same. I've heard many pastors say that, and it tells me one of, one of two things. Um, either they're completely ignorant and they're complete fools and have no idea what they're even talking about. Because when you look at the Bibles, or, or I should say, when you look at the Bible versions, King James Bible is the Bible, the rest are just Catholic uh, corruptions. But when you actually start comparing them, you see very quickly that they are not even close to the same. They say completely different things, they teach completely different uh, Jesuses. Um, and that's how you get this, uh, this peace, love, rock and roll Jesus I talk about, and there's these other Jesuses out there. You get them from these corrupt satanic versions. Um, anybody, anybody who reads those Bibles and, and sits down and looks, you can tell very quickly that they're not the same. But I've heard a lot of pastors preach this lie. So again, they're either complete fools and don't understand the, what's going on, and if that's true, they shouldn't be teaching the Bible at all, or they're just ministers of Satan, they know the truth, and they just don't care, and they're teaching the opposite for uh, reasons of, of serving Satan, not the Lord Jesus Christ. So those are the six I'm going to talk about uh, in this video. So I want to go back to number one. Everyone is welcome in God's house. That's the first big church building lie, or, or, or big lie of the church building, that you uh, may have heard in church buildings. I know I have. I know many of the brethren have too. Um, just in, in correspondence I've had. And again, this isn't just people in my area. This isn't even people in the United States. I've corresponded with people in Europe, and in Australia, and in, in different parts, in Africa, in, in different continents, different parts of the world. And I hear this a lot, that there's this, this lie that goes around that says that everyone's welcome in God's house. And so I want to look at that uh, because there, th this is really a, a, a two-part issue. Uh, so I want to look at both parts just so you fully understand how much of a lie this is uh, and, and, and how wicked of a teaching this is. Um, it, when you look at the Bible and you look at the Old Testament, the, the house of God, uh, it's also referred to as the house of the Lord. That starts out with with being um, representative of the tabernacle, okay, that first uh, traveling tent that, that the uh, Israelites used when, when, um, when God sent Moses to Egypt, and he had the Exodus and led them out of Egypt, um, and then that goes on into the temple that Solomon built. So this concept of house of God or house of the Lord, um, it actually starts way back in Genesis, um, um, originally, and then it kind of just goes up, and it's really in this Levitical priesthood period um, that, that occurs after Moses leads the Israelites out, and they establish the, um, the uh, Levitical priesthood. So the term house of God has nothing to do with the New Testament Christian. That's the first issue we're going to look at. So I'm going to look at some scripture, and this is an issue, if you, if you really want to fully understand it, there's a lot of scripture on this, go back to the Old Testament, Look at the scripture, see what it actually refers to, um, and it does not refer to anything of the of a New Testament church because there's no two New Testament church buildings anyway. Um, and as we'll see, we're the house of God as the as the New Testament Christian. We're the temple of God. God dwells within us, not temples made of hands, etc. And we're going to look at the scriptures. So. Um, Again, this is a two-part issue. We're first going to look at the, the fact that the term house of God has nothing to do with the New Testament Christian, so that makes, the, that makes it a lie right off the bat. Um, the other thing is that the everyone's welcome part, right? I've talked about this in other videos, so I'm going to briefly go over it here. Not everyone is welcome um, in a congregation or an assembly because you are not supposed to worship with lost people. You have no business worshiping with lost people because they don't worship the Lord. They worship Satan. So what you do is you go and you, 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 um, you preach, you, you evangelize, um, you go out and fulfill the Lord's great commission. You take the gospel to the world. You take the gospel to the lost. And if somebody gets saved, then you nurture them in the Word. Then you bring them into your assembly and, and make them part of your fellowship. If, if, you're, you know, if you get somebody saved in your local area and you have an assembly or a fellowship, great. Praise the Lord for that. Um, but you don't, you know, you don't um, you know, bring lost people to your house of God or your, or your church building and, and try to get them saved, which is something else we're going to talk about a little bit later. So let's go ahead and look then. I want to look at the term house of God. So let's go ahead and look at First Chronicles. And one thing that I want to say again is that there are a lot of scriptures on this. I could not possibly go through all of them. So I'm really just going to give you a sample here. 
please study this on your own if you want to know more about it. Um, the house of God has nothing to do with the New Testament Christian, period. Um, but I'm going to look at a, a few scriptures here that talk about it uh, coming out of the Old Testament. So let's go ahead and look at 1 Chronicles. And I want to look at chapter 2. And let's go, or I'm sorry, chapter 22. 1 Chronicles chapter 22. I want to look at verses 1 and 2 first. So verses 1 and 2, chapter 22. Then David said, This is the house of the Lord God, and this is the altar of the burnt offering for Israel. And David commanded to gather together the strangers that were in the land of Israel, and he set masons to hew wrought stones to build the house of God. Okay, so this is King David. He, this is talking about him preparing the material to have the temple built. He doesn't build the temple. Those of you who know your Bible know he wanted to. God did not want him to because David was a warrior. Um, he had a lot of blood on his hands, um, a lot of fierce battles. So God decides that Solomon is the one who's going to build it. But David, who is Solomon's father, is preparing and getting this ready so that when he hands off the kingdom to Solomon and then he, he dies... Uh, Solomon is the one who actually rebuilds the, or actually builds the temple. So um, I want to stay in chapter 22 and look at verses 5 and 6. And David said, Solomon, my son, is young and tender, and the, and the house that is to be built for the Lord must be exceedingly ma magnificent of fame and of glory throughout all countries. I will therefore now make preparation for it. So David prepared abundantly before his death. And he called for Solomon, his son and charged him to build a house for the Lord God of Israel. So, amen. So, that is where this, this term house of God, house of the Lord comes from. Okay? And again, it, it does start earlier on. I'm just giving you a, a scripture here that really shows the, the intent of it, which is that temple that Solomon's going to build. Um, it has to do with the Israelites. It has to do with the the Levitical system. It does not have to do with a New Testament Christian. There's no house of God, because again, there's no church building. But ministers of Satan use the scripture to their advantage. They pervert what is said in the Bible, and they'll say, see, house of God's in the Bible, uh, but it does not relate to a Christian. You have to look at the context upon which it, it appears. Um, so let's go ahead and look at that context. Let's look at 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. And I want to look at chapter 3. Now, Paul is writing here to Timothy. And you're going to see what the house of God is for a Christian today. Um, you have to rightly divide the word of truth when you look at scripture. And you cannot just blindly take a, a few words or a term or a verse out of context. You have to look at who it is applying to, who it is written to, what the context in which the verse appears. You can't just say, well, the, the Bible says house of God, therefore every building is a house of God. That's not true. So let's go ahead and look at 1 Timothy chapter 3. And I want to look at verse 14 and 15. So 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 14 and 15. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. Amen. So the let, let's go back in verse 15 here. Um, uh, Paul writes, But if I tarry long, that thou, thou, that, thou mayest, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth, or of the truth. Amen. So what we're going to look at here is that Paul is saying that the house of God is the church of the living God, right? This church of the living God. And I've talked about this in other videos. Who is the church? The church is the body of Christ. So let's look at some videos to prove that. You've got to put scripture with scripture. You cannot just take verses out of context. The Bible doesn't just plainly have just, you know, one verse that gives you all your doctrine. You've got to rightly divide the word of truth, and you've got to put verses together to get to what the Bible is actually teaching. That's why we're commanded to study, um, to show thyself approved. Let's go ahead then and look, and we'll find out what is the church. Okay, and I've talked about this in other videos, so I'm just going to briefly... Uh, review it here. Let's go ahead and go to Ephesians and we'll get what is the church. And I just want to look at Ephesians chapter 1 uh, verses 20 through 23. So Ephesians chapter 1 verse 20. Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. This is talking about God the Father. And set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion. And every name that is named not only in this world but also, but also in the world to come. And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, 
which which is his body, the fullness of him that is fulfilled all in all. Amen. So what this is saying here is that God has has given this the church to to Jesus Christ. To then the church is the body of Christ. Um, so if we go back and we look at uh, let's see verse twenty two and hath put all things under his feet. Okay, Jesus and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Jesus which is his body, Jesus, the, f the fullness of him that, f that filleth all in all. Amen. So that's what this is talking about here in context. Now let's look at some other verses here and add to this. Let's look at chapter 2, verse 19. Uh, we stay in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 19 through 22. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building, fitly framed together, groweth into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Amen. This is being written, obviously, to save people. That's why it's saying ye. So, we are, are part of, of this body of Christ, right? We are the building, so to speak, um, that, that Paul is writing about here. Uh, we are the house. We are where, where God dwells. Um, there is no house of God as an exterior building. Um, it's, it's, it's saved believers. Okay, So let's go ahead and look at some more scripture because there's a lot of scripture that, that prove this obvious biblical teaching. Um, so let's go ahead and look at Col Excuse me. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and look at Colossians. And I want to look at the book of Colossians. And I want to look at chapter 1, verse 16 and 18. So chapter 1, book of Colossians, verse 16. For by him were all things created. This is speaking of Jesus Christ. For by all him all things were created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things. And by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. Amen. Let's go back to the beginning of verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church, right? The church is the body of Christ, as I've said many times. Um, that is the scriptural teaching. The church is not a building. And as, and as I've said before, it's blasphemy to say that the church is a building. Because you're taking the body of Christ and you're saying, oh, no, no, Christ's body, no, no, that's not the church. It's this ridiculous building made out of wood and, and, and uh, brick and stucco and nails. That's really where the church is. That's disgraceful. If you call yourself a Christian and you're in a church building, you need to repent of that and get out. And I don't say that, again, to be prideful or arrogant or anything. I was in that wicked system. I repented and got out, and you need to too. And if you're saved, the Holy Spirit will get you out of that system at some point. All right, let's go ahead and stay in Colossians, and I want to skip down here to verse 23 and 24. Um, so verse 23 in chapter 1 says, If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the house of the or from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Amen. The church, again, is the body of Christ. Very clear scriptural teaching. And it's just, it's one of those things where I really think, because when I was in the church building system, I was very um, young in my faith. I didn't know the Bible very well. And once I start studying the Bible, it's just so clear. There's just no reason to be in a church building. They're not of God. They are a tradition that people are just used to going to. Um, but when you read the Bible, they don't appear in here anywhere. So you got to ask yourself, where did they come from if they didn't come from God? Okay, And we know where they came from. They came from Satan. All right, let's go ahead and look at... 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 Corinthians, so go ahead and turn back here, 1 Corinthians comes after Romans, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and I want to look at verse 16 and 17, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, 
which temple ye are. Again, ye, he's writing to the church of Corinth. So again, we are the temple of God, brethren. We are the building, okay? This exterior building with the cross on top in your local area, not the church. We are the church. And I know if you follow my channel, you probably heard me say that a lot, but there might be somebody new watching. There might be you know, somebody who's never seen my videos. So I, I like to hit this point every now and again when it's relevant because we need to never forget that, okay? If you're saved, there is no church building for you. You are the building, the body of Christ. You are part of the body of Christ. Uh, you do not need to attend a wicked building, and they are wicked. So I, I just, please, my prayers, if you're in one, get out of it immediately. Um, please. <laughs> uh, you're not going to get anything done for the Lord as a, as a Christian in one of those wicked places. All right. Um, now, let's stay in 1 Corinthians. I want to look at chapter 10. Because now we've established that there is no house of God. Okay, I, I showed you in the New Testament, or the Old Testament, rather, where what it is. Speaking of the tabernacle and then the temple. Um, and then when you look at the New Testament, it makes it very clear that we're the house of God. We're the temple. We're the building. Um, so there's no house of God, exterior building, house of God uh, for a Christian. So I want to go ahead and look at uh, a couple of scriptures that show that you're not supposed to have fellowship with lost people. So again, we're talking about the fact that this church building lie, everyone's welcoming God's house. What we've established no, they're not. There's no exterior of God's house, so that's out. This everyone's welcome concept is also out. So let's go ahead and look at some scripture to prove that that is a wicked lie that many people have been deceived by. I myself was deceived by it for a long time um, when I first started going to church buildings. All right, so 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and I want to look at verse 16 through 21. The cup of blessing which we, which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Behold, Israel after the flesh, are not they which eat of the sacrifice partakers of the altar? What say I then, that the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils. And not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. Amen. And this goes right along with what Jesus is talking about in John chapter 8 when he's rebuking the Pharisees and telling them that they're children of the devil. Yes, lost people are children of the devil. And that's something we forget because we, you know, we, we kind of get swept up in this worldly nonsense that, um, you know, and I'm going to talk about this uh, coming up, this whole, non this whole uh, uh, church building lie and, and really lie in the world um, of that, that, you know, God just loves the sinner and hates the sin and that kind of nonsense. No, he doesn't. There are lost sinners and there are saved sinners. And if you are a saved sinner, you have no business having fellowship with lost sinners. Period. End of story. They worship the devil. When you were lost, if you're saved and you're watching this, when you were lost, you were a child of the devil. You were a child of wrath. Now you are a child of God. So you cannot take that as a child of God and go and, and have fellowship with, with lost people. And you know that it mentions communion here too. And we're going to look at another verse here too about taking communion with lost people. Not supposed to do that. I personally have never been in a church building that didn't do that. Um, so I think that's also a very uh, common thing. Let's go ahead then and say in 1 Corinthians, and I want to turn to chapter 11, and I want to look at 26 through 29. So chapter 11, verse 26 through 29. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, do ye show the Lord's death till he come? Or do you shew the Lord's death till he come? Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood and excuse me, the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let let him eat of that bread and drink of of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Okay? Amen. You are not supposed to take communion with lost people. Okay? And the, the interesting thing about that is, when you do that, as the scriptures say, it, 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 let's go back and look at the uh, verse 29 there. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So if you're lost and you're in there and you're taking communion, you're get, you are um, you are getting damnation, right? So why do the church buildings then 
have lost people come in and then take communion when the Bible says that these people are, are earning damnation. That that's what they're bringing upon themselves by doing this. This angers God. So why do church buildings do this? And I've said before, have you ever been in a church building when it was communion time where the pastor got up and said, okay, everyone, we're going to go ahead and take communion. We're going to remember the sacrifice of our God, of the Lord Jesus Christ, what he did on that on that horrible Calvary's cross, what he did for us to, to shed his blood to pay for our sins. Now, if you're lost, please get up, exit the church building. We'll have ushers help you outside. Hang out there for about 10 minutes or so. We'll come out and get you when we're done. And then you can come back in and we'll go on with the service. Have you ever heard a church building pastor do that? No, never. And you never will. Why? Because they need lost people, because they need their money, right? These are not people of the Lord. So as a church building pastor, how can you possibly know this verse and know this scripture and bring lost people in to do communion when you're bringing damnation upon them? You're not even giving them a chance, right? You are not supposed to have communion with lost people, period. Communion is to remember the Lord Jesus Christ, to remember his body broken for us, to remember that blood he shed on Calvary's cross, to cleanse us wicked sinners of our sins. It's not to bring lost people in and make them feel part of the group, even though they hate the Lord, could care less about him, and, and blaspheme him all the time, and you bring them in and you think it's some big party. It's not. It's a special time to remember what the Lord did for us. So you do not bring people in that are children of the devil and have them partake in this incredible ceremony that we should be doing to remember the incredible sacrifice the Lord made for us. This is a serious thing. This isn't just part of some church service. And I know the church buildings make it that way. But as a Christian, this should be a very serious time for you. And you should not want lost people sitting next to you doing it with you. That's a disgrace. And I've been in many buildings that that has occurred. And I, and I find no excuse for a church building pastor to do that. These scriptures are very clear. Don't have communion with lost people. Don't have fellowship with lost people. Period. End of story. Alright, let's go ahead then. And I want to look at 2 Corinthians. <clears throat> excuse me. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And I want to look at verse 14 through 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 14 through 18. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God. And they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Yes, absolutely. Amen. Come out from among her. You're not supposed to be yoked with lost people. Okay? I think we've made this very clear from the scripture. So again, there's no house of God, external house of God. You are the house of God if you're a saved Christian. Um, and you're not supposed to have fellowship with lost people. So this church building line number one of everyone's welcomed in God's house, um, the, the context they're talking about it is everyone's welcome in the building. Okay, Not true. No house of God, external building, right? And not everyone's welcome in the congregation and in the assembly. Now, the interesting part about this is, in truth, this is actually true. Everybody is welcome in God's house in the sense that everyone has an opportunity to be saved. The Lord wants everyone to be saved. Okay, He takes no, no pleasure in the death of the wicked, as the Bible talks about. But the context that you hear this preached is not that context. It's context meaning of the external building, that everyone's uh, welcome in the church building. And that is a big church building line. And that's my first church building line, number one. Let's look at number two. Um, so my, my second big church building lie is you get lost people saved by bringing them to your church building. I have heard that so many times, brethren. I mean, in, in, in multiple church buildings, not, not just one. Okay, the, And again, these are not just things I heard by one pastor here. No, no, no. These are things I've been taught by many of uh, people calling themselves pastors. I mean, they were ministers of Satan. Now they look back at it. But at the time, I thought that they were of the Lord. I thought they were really uh, real pastors. But they most certainly were not. So I want to go ahead and start in Matthew. And I want to look at chapter 8. Or I'm sorry, 28. So... 
We're, we're talking about the second church building lie, uh, or big lie of the church building, is that you get lost people saved by bringing them into your building. That's how salvation comes, right? You, you go out, you round up lost people, get them into your building on Sunday morning at 9 a.m., and magically they just get saved, right? Wrong. Let's go ahead and look at what Jesus said, okay? Uh, chapter 28, verse 16, and we're going to go uh, through verse 20, the Great Commission. Then the, 11, then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, in the mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, and teach all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. The main part of this that I want to focus on is when Jesus says, Go, go, verse 19, Go ye therefore, and teach all the nations. Not go and get people and bring them into my church building that I built here, right? Jesus didn't have a church building because there were no church buildings. Now, he did go into the temple, obviously, right, to preach the truth and get people saved. Um, but it would be the same thing as if you went into a Jewish synagogue or, or a Roman Catholic uh, cathedral or any of these other um, uh, wicked cult buildings. It's not a church building, in other words, is what I'm trying to say. Jesus never built a church building. He is the building, right? We are part of his body. We are the building. Um, so again, Jesus, the Great Commission, go. He doesn't say go and get, go and round up, go and pick up, right? Uh, don't don't take the chariot and, and go pick people up at, you know, at, at early in the morning and bring them to my building. No, we're supposed to go to the lost world and preach the gospel. We're supposed to spread the gospel around the world to get people saved. And, and if they reject the Lord, fine. Um, they'll be judged for that, the great white throne judgment. But the point is, it's go. Go out. That's the great commission. It's not go and get and bring back. Okay? Alright, I want to look at Mark. Excuse me, Mark's the next gospel. And I want to look at chapter 16. I just want to look at one verse. Now, this is a... This is also... Um, um, let me see here, verse 15. This is also talking about the Great Commission. Um, it's talked about in, in, in Matthew, and then it's talked about in Mark. So I'm not going to read all the verses. I just want to read one verse here, verse 15, um, because this just hits on that same idea that I was just talking about. So uh, but Mark chapter 16, verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Let's read that again. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Amen. Jesus doesn't say, go ye into all the world and get everyone and put them in your chariot and bring them to the church building. Go ye. Get up. Go to the world. Go to every nation. Preach the gospel to every creature. Not bring them all into your building. Okay? So, again, satanic lie. Okay? That's the second uh, big church building lie that we're going to be talking about. That's just an introduction there, okay? So again, you don't go out and bring people in your building and get them saved. That's absolutely wicked. Let's go ahead and look at Ephesians. So let's go out of the Gospel, go into the Pauline Epistles, and I want to look at Ephesians. So, book of Ephesians, uh, chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. If you know your Bible, you definitely know these verses. So, book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Amen. Okay, that's uh, verse 8 and 9. So, let's look at that again. Verse 8. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man lest any man should boast. Amen. That's how salvation comes. Salvation comes through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. God gives us that opportunity through his incredible grace, which we don't deserve, myself included, by the way. So because of God's grace, we have the opportunity to place our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? That's how you get saved. And as we're going to see when we look at a few other verses here, that can be done anywhere. It doesn't have to be done in a church building. Okay? So again, that's how you get saved. It's not, um, you know, by, by God's grace um, are you saved through faith after you bring people into the church building. No, no. There's no building at all. There's no works at all. It's by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for us and his shed blood on Calvary's cross. All right, let's look at Titus. Go ahead and flip over here. Stay in the Pauline epistles, but go ahead and flip over to Titus. Okay, 
So Titus, a little, uh, very uh, short book, but a lot of good scripture in there. Let's go ahead and look at Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, by according to the mer but, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So again, we're, it's not by works of righteousness that we have done, okay? But according to his mercy, according to God's mercy, according to his incredible grace, he provides us this opportunity. Because without that mercy, without that grace, our faith would be meaningless. Because God wouldn't be providing us the opportunity. But because he's merciful, okay, because he's righteous, because he's just, he provides us wicked sinners an opportunity to get saved. We, we take that opportunity by placing our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It has nothing to do with bringing people into your building. Um, by, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Amen. You are regenerated. You are a new creature in Christ Je Jesus. Excuse me. When you get saved, there are changes that occur. Okay? Repentance is part of salvation. We're going to look at some verses on that too. It's not this believe and receive Rick Warren nonsense that you hear preached in the modern church. You are changed when you get saved. And if you have ever been changed by that experience, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And if you haven't, please get on your knees and get saved because you are not saved if there's no new creature. Period. You cannot ignore those verses. And we're going to look at some other verses on repentance. You cannot ignore those and just say it's believe and receive. That's nonsense. Repentance is not a work. It's part of the salvation process. Alright, let's go ahead and look at Acts. So let's go back here. Book of Acts. And let's go ahead and look at chapter 20. So, Book of Acts, chapter 20. And let's go ahead and look at 17 through 21. So, Book of Acts, chapter 20, uh, 17 through 21. And this is going to be Paul addressing the Ephesian uh, elders, so the church of Ephesus, the body of believers in Ephesus. Uh, chapter 17 in verse 20, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, <laughs> verse 17 in chapter 20. And, and from Miletus, and from Miletus he, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you, with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mine, and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing, that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly, and from the, and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. A couple things I want to look at here. Okay, let's go back to verse 17. Um, let's see, and let's see, call the elders of the church, verse 18. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you, been with you at all seasons. So again, Paul came to them. Okay, they didn't come to the the first church of, of Paul or something. Okay, <laughs> they didn't. You know, the first church of Paul the apostle. No, that doesn't exist. Paul went out to them, okay, and preached the gospel. Let's go ahead and look at um, verse 19. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind and many tears and temptations, which befell me by lying awake, uh, lying awake of the Jews. And now I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly, have taught you publicly from house to house. Not church building to church building. Okay, Paul didn't go to all the church buildings. There were no church buildings at this time. Okay, this is something I know. If you know this, I'm sorry to be repeating myself. But so many people are deceived by this, thinking that, that there were church buildings in the New Testament, and these churches at Ephesus, Ephesus and Corinth, and Thessalonica, etc., were church buildings. They were not. They were, body, they were bodies of believers. They were people that heard the gospel and got saved. That's what they were. They are bodies of Christ. They are assemblies. They are not buildings, okay? So, again, he goes from house to house, not church building to church building. And you get that same thing from Paul's going to them. They're not coming to him. That's the problem. You do not get people saved by them coming to you. You go to them. Okay? That's a very big problem. And then verse 21, testify both to the Jews and the Greeks. Repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance is part of salvation. Okay? If you are an easy believism heretic... 
how do you deal with that verse? You don't. Okay, repentance is part of salvation. Um, I know a lot of people believe that it's just believe and receive, but you know what you need to realize is that's Rick Warren's gospel. Rick Warren's a minister of Satan. You don't want to share a gospel with a minister of Satan, okay? So again, it's repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, okay? It's not a work, and we're going to see that again um, as we continue on. So now I want to look at a few examples of people who got saved um, without a church building, okay? So let's look at chapter 26. Uh, so at, I mean, let's stay in the book of Acts rather and then we'll look at chapter 26 and chapter 26 this is going to be Paul and he's giving his testimony here uh, when he's called to go before uh, Agrippa okay and this um, you can read this whole chapter we're just going to look at a few verses here and the reason I'm doing it this way rather than going and doing Paul's testimony separately you can read about that in uh, Acts chapter 9 um, is that he gives his whole testimony of how he got saved um, but then he goes into a little more detail. So I want to use this to sort of kill two birds with one stone. So what we're going to hear is that Paul is going to be recounting when the Lord Jesus Christ saved him on that road to Damascus. Okay, Again, you can read about it in Acts chapter 9 if you want to know more about that specifically. Um, and that, you know, after, after that happened, Paul goes... Again, in Acts chapter 9, it talks about this. Paul goes to um, the house of Judas, not Judas Iscariot, um, another Judas. Um, and Ananias comes to him... Um, and lays hands on him, gives him a sight back. The Lord Jesus Christ is the one who calls Ananias to go and meet Paul. And again, you can read about that all in, in Acts chapter 9, but I'm just giving you a, a little background on that. And then Paul becomes filled with the Holy Ghost. But Paul gets saved on that road to Damascus when, interestingly enough, he's actually going out to round up Christians, to persecute Christians, because that's what he thought he was supposed to do as a Jew. Okay, He was a tribe of Benjamin. Okay, He was a Jew at that time. He was a Pharisee. So he's actually going out to persecute Christians, and the Lord saves him on his way. It's an, it's an incredible uh, piece of scripture. So go ahead and, and look at Acts chapter 9 on your own. Um, but let's stay in 20, or we're in 26, chapter 26, and we'll look at verse 13 through 20. So verse 13 says, At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven, above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me, and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me, and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, while per persecutest thou me, it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Okay, let's stop there for a second. Again, when Jesus comes to Paul on the road to Damascus, okay, there's no church building involved, okay, Jesus comes to him, he, um, he, he shines this light on him and he just plain asks him, why are you persecuting me? And the interesting thing about this is there's no biblical record of Paul actually persecuting Jesus personally. But, G but Paul is, is actively going out to persecute uh, Christians, which are the body of Christ, as we've talked about. So when you persecute Christians, you're persecuting the Lord Jesus Christ is what these verses are telling us. So very interesting to keep that in mind. Jesus is saying, you know, why are you persecuting me? Because you're persecuting my people, you're persecuting me. Okay, it wasn't just, he wasn't persecuting Jesus personally, but he was persecuting Christians as the body of Christ. Again, what's the body of Christ? The church, as we've talked about before. Let's go ahead and look at verse 16. Um, but rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee. Verse 17, deliver thee from the, deliver thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified which are sanctified by faith that is in me whereupon O King Agrippa I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision uh, let's uh, stay here and we're in verse 20 but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Amen. So let's go back here. I, I want to just go back a couple of verses here. Let's look at verse 18, okay? To open their... This is Jesus Christ speaking to, to Paul. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan... 
right, the power of Satan, unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So again, turn them from Satan unto God. When you are lost, you are a child of the devil, right? So that's what, that's what Jesus is instructing Paul here, to go preach the gospel, to turn people from that wickedness, to turn them to the Lord Jesus Christ, to God, to the truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Let's look at verse 20. This is key. But show first unto them in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles that they should repent, repent, and turn to God, and do works meet for repentance. Amen. Works meet for repentance, meaning not works to be saved. No, no, no. Okay? That when you are saved, works will follow. Okay? Because you are a new creature in Christ Jesus. You are not the same person anymore. You've been turned from death unto life. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. That's going to produce some changes. Now again, it, it doesn't mean everybody's going to have the same amount of changes. It's going to take the same amount of time. No. But there will be a difference in you. That is the key. That is repentance. Okay? It's not a work. It happens at the same time. You come to God. You're a wicked sinner. You want to be saved. You want to be changed. You need help. You call out to the Lord for help. And he saves you. It's just that simple. But you don't go to a church building and get up on stage with the big stage lights and the rock and roll music and say, yeah, I believe in Jesus, whatever, and automatically you're saved. And the reason why I say that is I've seen people do that, and it's disgraceful. That does not save you, okay? You're saved through believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. But as we see here in these verses, you turn from that wickedness. It doesn't mean that you, you, you're you sinlessly perfect. No. You change the way you think. That repentance process. You realize that you need salvation. When you just pray a prayer and say, Yeah, I believe in Jesus. Save me. You don't think you need to be saved. You think you're wonderful. Most people in church buildings do. They're self-righteous. They're prideful. They're arrogant. They've never been broken. They've never been brought down to that point where they realize that they need a Savior. That they want the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, brethren... This all happened on a road, right? On a dirt road, okay? Walking on a road to go and persecute Christians, the Lord Jesus Christ comes down and saves Paul, okay? And then uses him for great things. Paul does great things, and, and you read through the book of Acts, and read through, the, read through the epistles. He paid a big price for it, and if you're a Christian, you paid a big price for being a Christian as well. There's persecution that comes, absolutely. Um, but the point is, this did not happen anywhere near a building. The Lord Jesus Christ just went out and saved Paul. Okay, So again, going out to the people, not bring him in your building. Let's look at another example. Let's stay in the book of Acts. And I want to look at Acts chapter 8. <clears throat> Excuse me. Acts chapter 8. And I want to look at verse 26. And let's see. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. This is going to be um, with, with Philip and the... Um, the Ethiopian eunuch. Okay, so let's. This is going to be a few verses here, but I think it's important to read. So let's look at verse 26, chapter. I'm sorry, chapter 8, verse 26 through 39. Uh, uh, verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem to Gaza, which is the desert. Again, the angel of the Lord comes to Philip. Arise and go. Okay, not go and grab people and bring them back. Okay, again, it's that same concept. We go out as, as Christians, as the Lord's representatives. We go out as ambassadors of Christ. We don't go and bring people back. Okay? Very important. All right. Uh, verse 27. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a, a, an eunuch of great authority, under, Can, under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. Again, let me stop there. Go. It's that same thing. Go to him. Go to them. Take the gospel to the, the world. Not go and get them and bring them into your building. No, no, no. Okay? Let's look at verse, uh, pick up on verse 30. And Philip ran, ran thither to him. Ran to him. Ran to him, brethren. He ran to him. He didn't go and grab him and, and haul him into the church building. He went to him um, and heard him and, and heard him read the read uh, the prophet Isaiah and said, "Understandest thou, or understandest thou what thou readest?" Let me stop here. 
this is witnessing, right? He's going to this guy, who's, who, the Ethiopian, who's obviously reading Isaiah. He's looking for truth. He's trying to find out what the truth is. He has that spirit that's wanting to be saved, right? So the Holy Spirit tells Philip, hey, go to him. Go get him, you know? Go preach the gospel. Go witness to him. And watch what happens. Uh, verse 31. And he says, How can I accept some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sat with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearers, so opened he not his mouth. In his, humil in his humiliation, his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speakest the prophet uh, this, of himself or of some other man? Let me stop there. So again, the eunuch is asking questions. He's wanting to know. He's seeking the Lord, okay? This is a picture of repentance. He is wanting to know the truth. He's wanting to be saved. He just doesn't understand. Because again, as the Bible teaches us, when somebody's lost, they don't understand the Bible. It's foolishness under them. The preaching of the cross is foolishness, okay? To those that aren't saved. So he is trying to figure this out, and, and Philip's here to help him, okay? Um, let's see. Uh, and, and the eunuch... Um, Oh, uh, verse uh, 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and began, or began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thy heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Okay, again. He's believing, he's professing, he's wanting to be saved. He is pursuing salvation. That's the point here. Um, let's, uh, let's keep going here to verse 39. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. Amen. So again, you, you, the Holy Spirit leads Philip to, to this person, the Ethiopian eunuch, who's wanting to be saved. He's trying to figure this out. He can't. He's, he's, he's in that repentant state. He's trying to figure out what, what Isaiah is talking about here. Okay? He realizes he needs salvation. He believes on the Lord Jesus Christ. He's saved. Then Philip takes him and baptizes him. Okay? So again, this is, uh, this is a picture of not needing to bring people to the church building. Okay? If you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit will lead you to the people. Okay, it's not bring them to you because you're too lazy to go out and preach to them, which is what the modern church is. It, and you know, by the way, it's filled with ministers of Satan. They can't they can't get people saved because they're not saved anyway. But the point is, this is what we're supposed to do. It's not go and round people up. All right, let's look at one more example. Acts chapter sixteen. Acts chapter sixteen. I want to look at um, verse. Let's see, twenty five. So Acts chapter 16, verse 25, and this is going to be the Philippian jailer getting saved, okay? So let's go ahead and look here. Um, Acts chapter 16, verse 25 through 31. So um, let's see. Okay, so um, Acts chapter 16, and we're going to look at verse 25 through 30, yes, 31. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prison of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison awakened out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, do thyself no harm, for we, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, and sprang in, and came trembling, and fell down before Paul and Silas. So again, this prison guard is coming out, and, and he's trembling. That's a picture of repentance. He realizes what is going on. He realizes the power of God that's taken place, and he's wanting to be saved. 
right? Now, this is not, this is occurring in a building, right? It's occurring in a prison. People get saved in prisons all the time. My point is that you don't get, you don't get people saved by rounding them up and bringing them to your church building on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Salvation can happen anywhere. Let's keep reading. In uh, verse 30, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Again, he's seeking the Lord. He is in that picture of repentance. He's trying to be saved. He's realizing what is going on here. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thine house. Um, and what he's talking about there is just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And when he's saying thine house, he's not saying that, oh, and by the way, your whole family automatically gets saved. No, this is showing, and it goes on to talk about this more um, in verses 32 through 34, which I'm not going to read for the sake of time. Um, the way that you, that people in your house, people in your family, because you have the light of Christ, because you're saved, because you have the Holy Spirit in you, they will see that. And if they're wanting salvation, they can get saved too. It's a great way that, that, that the Lord does that. Um, the way that somebody in a family gets saved, and then that person's able to get other people saved. It doesn't always work that way. But that's what we're talking about here. Or that's what the verses are talking about here. So again, the Philippian um, uh, jailer, okay, he was not saved in a church building. Paul and, and, and Silas didn't say, okay, we're out, great. Go ahead, come with us. We're going to go out to our church building and we'll get you saved. No, that he got saved right there. Okay, so again, you do not need the church building um, to be saved. Let's go ahead and look at one more set of verses here. I want to look at Luke. And let's look at Luke chapter 23. So let's go ahead and look at Luke chapter 23. And I want to look at verse 39 through 43. So, uh, Luke 23, verse 39 through 43. And one of the malefactors which were hanging railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest in thy kingdom, into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Amen. So this is what's going on in the cross when Jesus is, is, is uh, between the, the, the two people on the side of him. And this guy gets saved because he realizes who Jesus is. He believes on Jesus, and Jesus saves him right there. He doesn't say, well, wait, wait till we're off the cross and we'll go into the church building, or sorry, if we weren't being crucified, I'd take you to my church building and get you saved. No, he gets saved hanging on a cross a few minutes before he dies, maybe even a few seconds before he dies, because he believes on the Lord Jesus Christ and he's repentant. He realizes he needs to be there. He realizes he's a sinner. He realizes he deserves death. But Jesus does not deserve that. He realizes Jesus hasn't done anything wrong. Again, picture of repentance. Very simple, okay? This guy gets saved hanging on a cross maybe seconds before he dies. Okay. So again, brethren, um, this second point here that you get you get people saved by bringing them to your church building um, is absolutely unscriptural, as you can see. Okay. Now, can people get saved in church buildings? Sure. People can get can get saved in jails. People can get saved in 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 um, whorehouses. People can get saved in a school. People can get saved in a backyard, in a home, anywhere. Okay. The point is. Salvation is not through bringing people to your church building, okay? It's taking the gospel to them, and that salvation can happen anywhere. So let's go ahead then and look at my third big lie of the church building, which is that everyone who says they're a Christian is saved. 